speed is everything. Victims don't last very long when they're in the rubble pile. As the victims have time go by, they're less likely to survive because of injuries or just simple entombment from uh, dehydration, things like that. Searching for people buried in the rubble and collapsed buildings has pretty much stayed the same for the last 30 years. We've worked in the past with NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory, and they came to us and they told us they developed this technology that would use microwave radar to detect human heartbeats. Finder is a radar that sends a low power microwave signal through the rubble. It looks for the very tiny reflections caused by the motion of the victim's breathing and heartbeat. Finder can detect human heartbeats and breathing through 30 feet of debris or 20 feet of solid concrete, even if the victim is unconscious or unable to call out for help. Working with the first responders has been the best part of doing Finder. We have learned so much from working with an actual team like here at Virginia Task Force One. When they started initial testing with this device, we were able to supply them with a location, make it as realistic as possible, test the equipment, find out some of the things that we would like to see change. At our suggestion, they were able to integrate this into a lightweight, waterproof container that was to military spec that we could actually wear on our back because everything we take, we carry with us. We're also looking to have systems you could actually put on the back of a vehicle. We're looking to be able to put one on a, a quadcopter and fly it over top of the pile and actually scan down, which is much more efficient. Target markets for this product would be uh, certainly for search and rescue in avalanches, earthquakes, tsunamis, tornadoes, hurricanes, any natural disaster and any type of FEMA-like agency would certainly uh, need a device like this. It's northwest of Kathmandu, it's called Chitara. And in Chitara, it was decimated. A number of buildings collapsed, and there were international rescue teams there. In Nepal, Finder was used to augment the search and rescue team. They have a number of tools in their tool belt. Some are canine dogs, some are acoustic measuring systems, some are actual camera systems that they put down in a hole. And Finder was used as a way to confirm other findings. Four people were rescued directly by Finder. So uh, you saw the challenge. The challenge in, in earthquakes is the in large scale earthquakes and why Homeland Security came to JPL in the first place was Haiti. Hundreds and hundreds of structures that were destroyed, uh, limited time to go find the people. Which one of those store which one of those structures has somebody in it? What they were looking for is this, you know, holy grail. Is they want to walk down the street and have it say, that one, that one, not that one, that one. And um, we had been looking at, you know, the technology of using Doppler radar to go look for heartbeats is actually quite old. There are some folks at uh, Michigan State who had done quite well with it. The challenge was that it wasn't portable, it wasn't field ready, and that's more a matter of the technology that hadn't yet developed. So there was this interesting convergence uh, of, of technologies that became available right around this time that made it possible. Because here's what search and rescue teams use now. Canines, listening devices, and everything else, as, as the guy said. So one of the important things that the undersecretary uh, at Homeland Security said was, she was an emergency room physician, so she has a very real and visceral connection to the whole disaster response problem, is that uh, an 80% solution is great. We don't have to solve all the problems. We don't have to find all the victims. The sooner you can get a solution into the field and saving people, those are people you are saving, and then you can keep working on finding the other 20% five years later. So we had been doing remote sensing. I mean, that's what JPL does, is we look at things that are a long way away. And so to us, in some ways, this is very similar. It's another remote sensing problem, except that it Instead of looking at the surface of Mars, we're looking 10 meters through some rubble to detect a very tiny motion from a heartbeat. 
And so we started in 2012 and uh, we had our first prototype in 2013. That's when we went out to the rubble pile in Lorton, Virginia. It's a long way from JPL where we're in California, but it's close to DC where all of the sponsors are. Uh, and actually that, they have a great rubble pile there. So we uh, did testing there. We went through several iterations. It was kind of a classic spiral development where we would have a batch of software. We would take it out. The first responders would use it. They'd all go home. That night, we'd change all of our software, which was facilitated because, it, well, it's in MATLAB. And you just edit it and reload, and away we go. And, uh, and then we did it. Then we had a uh, final prototype in September. Uh, we had great press coverage, which uh, had a unique aspect for commercialization. Uh, you know, at Jet Propulsion Lab, we're researchers. We don't actually manufacture anything. And so we were looking for manufacturing partners, and everybody said, well, that's very nice. You know, that's an interesting technology. We don't really see the need for it. Uh, we had this uh, demo in September 2013, which was the week before the government shut down. And so there was a lot of press coverage because they wanted to cover anything other than Congress not getting their act together. So we got lots of press coverage, and then all the people who might potentially want to license the finder technology and go build things said, well, there's all these newspaper articles. Maybe there is a market. And so those of you who have ever had to deal with the can I get capital to do my invention now know what it's all about. And then as uh, was pointed out, we did uh, exercises all over the United States during 2014. We had the success in Nepal. And, you know, so a little bit about how Finder works. It does not image. Everybody, when you first say, oh, it's like x-ray vision, I can see the victim in the rubble and we'll go rescue him. All it does is tell you there's somebody alive in there. And uh, it's, think of it more as a big flashlight or a spotlight, a uh, floodlight that you shine on a building. And, and how it actually works is it's simple microwave radar. We send out a radar beam and it reflects off of everything and the things that move, the phase changes a little bit, we detect that phase change. It is no different than the radar that the policeman uses to tell that you were speeding. And uh, although ours is a little more specialized, uh, the whole design process is one where we started out, we wanted to know what kind of attenuation would you see, what are the signals gonna look like, so we did a lot of numerical modeling. Uh, there's this uh, cool uh, model there, we built a synthetic rubble pile, the, um, it was built by a hybrid. Let's see, the drawing was actually generated in uh, uh, Pavre from MATLAB code that generated all the objects. The random objects are generated in MATLAB, but the actual simulation is a big Fortran finite element code. And then we brought the finite element results back into MATLAB and processed it to generate the synthetic impulse response. Uh, so from that, we were able to say, yes, it'll probably work. Uh, we'd already done some practical demos. The eventual architecture we came up with was uh, an array, a uh, single transmitter and four receivers. Uh, that's so that you can tell whether the heartbeats you are detecting are coming from in front of the box or behind. Because if you're standing behind it, uh, it will detect you. You can't build an antenna with infinite front to back ratio. So if I'm standing behind it and I'm only a meter away, my heartbeat is actually quite a bit stronger than the heartbeat from the person who's 10 meters in the rubble. So we have these little sensors that actually generate the signals that gets transmitted at three gigahertz, receive it, detect it, generate IQ output. And that goes into a processing chain written in MATLAB uh, where we take the raw IQ data, we do some feature processing and extraction to determine potential heartbeats. And uh, that's an interesting process because what we actually do is a nonlinear model fit that's sequential. We look for, uh, not just a sine wave, breathing's fairly sinusoidal, but heartbeats are interesting because your heart rate varies over time. And that's sort of what allows us to distinguish between human heartbeats and say a fan that just happens to be turning at once a second or a pendulum swinging, is that we can actually match up the variations in the heart rate with a corresponding signal that we've determined that's in the breathing band. And then we define that and we put up a response for the uh, user that basically says, there's somebody there, or not. Uh, in tests, it's about 80% accurate. 
Uh, in other words, if, if there's a uh, victim in the rubble, there's about a 20% chance we won't see them. And if there's no victim in the rubble, there's about a 20% chance that we'll say there's somebody there. You can fool around with the, the, uh, the decision parameters. And actually, that's something we're looking at in, in another connection is to, you know, is there a way to improve the performance? Are there other features we can find in the signal than these, which were done by a non-machine learning, totally let's go try this algorithm and see if it works approach. Uh, and so we're actually just starting to look at that. The other thing we're interested in is uh, right now we're looking for heartbeats on essentially non-moving targets. The idea is that you're unconscious, you're not moving. If you're dancing around in that room buried in the rubble, we'll see the motion, but we won't see your heartbeat. Um, so the, the general process that is followed, and this is another interesting area for future work, is that in process what happens is you go down a street and you take multiple scans. You, you wait, it takes about 30 seconds, you gather data for 30 seconds, Right now, it takes about 30 seconds to process on a uh, slow, tough book laptop to get the results. That's a lot faster than they wanted. Originally, they were hoping that we could do it every 20 minutes. Uh, so getting one in every minute is actually pretty good, but everybody always wants it to go faster. So then what we're doing is we're going to move along, and you, you collect multiple data, and you want some way to merge that data and perhaps combine it with mapping. And so there's a whole issue of trying to geolocate the data you've gotten, which direction was it pointed. Most of that is something that we expect the industry partners to do. Um, we've developed the sensor, we've transitioned it. Uh, the idea is, is that, as I said, there was this sort of convergence of, of, of fortuitous events. We had these algorithms for detecting tiny faint signals and noise. That's what we do for a living at JPL. Uh, the wireless industry, had made the components really small. Several people here have talked about, well, now I can, the ultrasound, I can run it on my cell phone. And uh, the other thing is this small, fast, battery-powered computers. The Michigan State researcher, when I was talking to him, he's retired and playing golf in San Diego now. And I said, well, we're going to build this thing. We're going to take a system much like yours, and we're going to put it into a little box. He's going, well, how will you afford to make it affordable? Because the phase shifter costs $5,000. And I said, not anymore. <laughs> it's two, and two dollars, and uh, so we, we we did that. We've transitioned to industry. There's a couple of companies, R4 and Spec Ops Group, that are making finders and modifying them. Um, so eventually, you can be rescued by this, uh, as the Adrian from uh, uh, Spec Ops said. You know, the avalanches are actually probably the biggest use in the United States. We have building codes. If there was a big earthquake here today, well. East Coast, don't get many earthquakes, it's hard to say. But odds are we would all survive here. The building would stand up in a fairly good sized earthquake. Uh, perhaps not so in Turkey. And, uh, but in the United States, about 30 people a year die in avalanches. And so uh, that, that's actually a, a significantly higher risk of you getting killed in an avalanche than getting killed in an earthquake in the United States. But, so this, that's where the technology is going.